Thank you to Benjamin Tran for helping me to put this video together about hip arthroscopy. The hip arthroscopy table is actually an attachment applied to a regular table uh, with which we can apply traction safely during hip scopes. The gross traction is this orange knob on the side of the apparatus, which allows me to freely move the boot uh, approximately and distally. Ensure this is completely locked before utilizing fine traction, which is this knob here on the end of the apparatus. By spinning this, it turns a crank, which applies uh, smaller amounts of traction to this boot. Utilize this frequently during surgery to apply varying degrees of traction safely. At the end of the leg is a orange knob, which will unlock the entire leg when turned 90 degrees. This allows you to position the leg for surgery. This is the operative boot. As you can see, the, the strap system is more sophisticated for better control over the foot. During surgery, the foot must be very well padded. We use these foam boots here wrapped with coban in order to ensure that all pressure points are well, very well protected during surgery. When applying the coban, uh, wrap it fairly tight and make sure the foot is out of equinus. It's important to keep the boot uh, well secured so you can apply traction safely. The perineal post is applied between the legs. As you can see, this is an oversized perineal post with a double foam assembly, which will disperse the force across the perineum. The internal foam, the gray foam, is harder than the external foam, the white foam, so the pudendal nerve is protected during surgery. Move the patient down the table onto the perineal post, ensuring that the gray foam is well positioned against the ischium. Place each foot into the uh, boot apparatus and lock it down tightly. It's important when placing the operative straps across the ankle that the back strap is around the Achilles tendon and the front strap is over the ankle. This will provide better control of the ankle during surgery. Make sure it's very tight so that you don't lose traction intraoperatively. The other two straps are then positioned across the forefoot and across the leg to maintain control. The landmarks for hip arthroscopy are as follows. The ASIS and the patella are the landmarks to create a vertical line down the leg. Second, you find the greater trochanter and mark the back and the front of the greater trochanter in, in order to uh, accurately place your portals. A transverse line drawn across the tip of the greater trochanter, which will intersect with the vertical line, will show you the safe zone for hip arthroscopy. A standard anterior lateral portal just off the anterior tip of the greater trochanter is the main viewing portal, while the intersection of the transverse and vertical line is called a direct anterior portal, and the posterior lateral portal is made posterior to the greater trochanter. Note that the lateral femoral nerve will run across the area of the anterior portal, and thus many surgeons have moved the anterior portal more lateral and more distal uh, to safely uh, intermit within the hip joint. A distal anterior portal is an accessory portal that can be used for anchor placement or for peripheral work. Here is the marks of the different portals for this right hip. One must first establish the anterior lateral portal. Once traction is applied, uh, place the spinal needle at the uh, capsule. Normally this is uh, directed slightly cephalad and then toward the floor slightly in order to get good access to the joint. Note that the tip of the needle should pass between the acetabulum and the femoral head. Uh, once you've entered the joint, you may remove the stylus and place a uh, night nail wire in the center of the joint. Once the night nail wire is placed, this will allow safe access to the joint with your cannula system. The skin is incised. Once you incise the skin, ensure there's no skin bridges by placing a hemostat clamp around the uh, night nail wire. This is a metal cannula, 5.0 millimeters in, in diameter. Place this over the guide wire, but ensure the guide wire glides easily within the cannula to ensure you're not kicking it or causing any sort of problem with the guide wire. The hip capsule is a uh, very robust tissue and requires some force in order to penetrate it. However, be very careful not to plunge. The majority of the surgery will be performed using a 70 degree arthroscope. Place it in the joint and then find the anterior, anterior triangle. Establish the mid anterior portal using a spinal for localization followed by a night nail wire. 
and size the skin and then place your second cannula through the mid-anterior portal. As you're entering the joint, make sure not to contact the articular surface. Again, make sure the nitinol wire uh, freely moves within the cannula so you do not kink it or break it. Once you've established your anterior portal, you may switch this camera to the anterior portal in order to evaluate the location of your, of your anterior lateral portal. Here, the anterior lateral portal is safely between the labrum and the femoral head. At this point, we'll perform a capsulotomy using a capsulotomy knife. This is placed through the cannula. The cannula is then withdrawn, and the knife may be freely manipulated within the joint. We will first make a very small incision posteriorly, and then we'll bring the incision anteriorly in order to establish an interportal capsulotomy. The goal here is to create a capsulotomy with clean edges parallel to the labrum, approximately eight millimeters to one centimeter off the labrum. We'll complete the capsulotomy by switching the portal, the camera back to the anterior lateral portal and using the knife to the mid-anterior portal. Once the capsulotomy is connected, you'll have free access to the joint. This is how the room is set up during this portion of the case. Once we have in, uh, access to the joint from a diagnostic arthroscopy, it is critical to characterize the pattern of damage in order to plan the repair. Here, he has a labral tear as well as a chondral wave sign indicative of long-standing femoral acetabular impingement. The labrum is unstable with loose fragments anteriorly A shaver is used to expose the acetabular rim. Here we're taking off uh, some capsules so we may be able to see the labrum and then use an RF device in order to expose the acetabular rim. Capsular management is critical here and it's important to save as much capsule as possible for later closure. A high-speed burr is used to perform an acetabuloplasty. Here we're just trying to recess the rim behind the labrum to remove any pincer type mechanism to his impingement. It's important to create a smooth uh, rim here and have good transitions both anteriorly and posteriorly. The shaver is then used to perform a chondroplasty and remove any loose label fragments of the chondrolabel junction. Here, the label is clearly unstable and we need to plan the repair. The acetabular rim is explored for positioning of anchors. The first anchor will be placed most anteriorly at approximately 2.30 o'clock. Using a curved drill guide, we'll place the first anchor, and as we drill, we watch the articular surface to ensure there's no articular surface penetration. The anchor is placed, and the two suture limbs are retrieved out the interior portal. A curved suture passer is used to pass one limb at the chondrolabral junction. Given the orientation of this tear and the size of the labrum, we will plan a vertical mattress type suture configuration. The suture will be retrieved through the labral substance so that the labral base is secured to the acetabular rim. This minimizes the amount of suture that will contact the femoral head and will allow a good contour of the labrum once we complete the repair. A standard arthroscopic knot is used, in this case an SMC knot, to secure the labrum against the bone. As you place this knot, ensure that the knot is high up off the labrum and against the acetabular rim so the knot material is not interposed between the rim and the femoral head. The labrum is evaluated for its contour. A second anchor is placed slightly more posteriorly, approximately one centimeter away from the first anchor. Again, the labrum is secured using a vertical mattress type technique, with one limb being at the chondrolabral junction 
and then it's retrieved through the label of substance to create a good contour for this label repair. Again, the knot is placed high up off the articular surface. A third, a third anchor is placed more posteriorly. The labrum is then secured here in the same fashion using a vertical mattress type technique. After the last anchor is tied and the suture is cut, we may evaluate the labrum for security. Here you can see the labrum is very well secured against the acetabular rim with a good contour and no residual instability. There's no loose label fragments. Traction is released and the labral seal is reestablished. At this point, we turn our attention to the peripheral compartment. Hibis flex up to approximately 40 degrees so the access to the peripheral compartment is, is uh, facilitated. This relaxes the capsule and also brings the, the cam deformity into view. We mark the cam deformity out under fluoroscopy and ensure that we have the apex of the cam deformity well established so we, we may be planing our uh, femoroplasty. An RF device will be used to remove some of the periosteum as well as some of the cartilage so that we may plan our cam takedown. A high-speed burr is then used to decompress the cam deformity. We start with the hip inflection and take down the anterior cam deformity. As we move anteriorly, it may require more flexion and external rotation. As we move posteriorly, it may require more extension and internal rotation. We will remove all of the uh, excess bone here and ensure we have an excellent contour of the hip. This may take uh, some time in order to ensure that all the transitions both anteriorly and posteriorly are smooth and there's no residual offset problems. The vessel should be identified both anteriorly and posteriorly to ensure there's no compromise of the blood flow. It should be noted during the thermoplasty that some bone may, may be very hard and sclerotic and may require some force to remove, whereas some bone may be quite soft and require very little force to remove. After the thermoplasty, the head and neck junction is carefully scrutinized to ensure there's no residual cam type deformity. The labral seal is also evaluated. Under fluoroscopy, we confirm adequate decompression of the cam deformity. The capsule will be closed with orthocord or vicral suture. A capsule closure device such as this would be used to pass suture through the each limb of the capsule in order to ensure that the capsule is adequately closed in the case. In this case, the proximal limb is being secured using this suture. Once it's passed the proximal limb, it is retrieved the distal limb. You do not want to take large capsular bites here because you can over constrain the capsule. A standard orthoscopic knot here is used in order to secure the capsule. We typically place two to three sutures to the capsule in order to ensure a watertight closure. The sutures are cut and the capsulotomy is evaluated to ensure that there's good uh, approximation of the capsular limbs and no residual defects. Thank you for watching.